Great. Uh, thanks for coming out. My name is Christopher Klein. I'm the author of the new book, When the Irish Invaded Canada. Um, how many of you were here to, to the talk I gave this morning? Okay, a few of you. So hopefully, I'm, I'm going to try not to cover too much ground, but there might be just a little bit of overlap between the, the two talks. So uh, hopefully everyone's ready for St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, in a, a holiday now is probably about as American as the 4th of July and, and Thanksgiving, but what I'm going to do this afternoon is take you back to a time when no American wanted to be Irish, not even for a day. So in the early morning hours of March 6, 1854, a night watchman was quietly reading by the light of his lamp inside a wooden shack in the heart of Washington, D.C. Outside his door was the stump of the Washington Monument, which was still under construction. And under the cover of night, a group of men snuck into the construction site for the Washington Monument. They wrapped cords around the shack that the watchman was sitting in. They piled stones against his door to make sure that he could not get out. And then they proceeded to start scouring the construction site for a precious stone. This was not some sort of valuable gem, however, but it was a pink and white block of marble that bore the inscription, Rome to America. So the vandals are on the site. They finally spot this block of marble. They load it onto a cart, and they wheel it about a quarter mile down to where the water is. And if you've been to the Washington Monument, the, the land has changed quite a bit since it was constructed. The, the Potomac River used to be a lot closer. They took this heavy marble stone onto the boat, rowed out to the middle of the Potomac River. A watchman on the bridge signaled with a red lantern that the coast was clear, and they took the marble, flung it overboard, and sent it to the depths of the Potomac. So what is driving a bunch of vandals to commit such an act of, uh, of criminal behavior? Well, in one word, Catholicism. <laughs> this marble piece was donated by Pope Pius IX in response to a call to leaders all around the world to contribute to the construction of the Washington Monument. And this particular piece of marble was actually taken from a Roman ruin. But to the men who committed this act of vandalism, these were anti-Catholic know-nothings. So they thought it an outrage that the Pope would donate a block of marble to the Washington Monument. They thought it was a desecration to the memory of George Washington. According to one New Jersey petition, they, this is what they wrote, this gift of a despot, if placed within those walls, can never be looked upon by true Americans, but with feelings of mortification and disgust. A man from Baltimore named John Wisehample published his own pamphlet about the block of uh, marble from Rome, and he wrote that he thought that the, that the block was a secret signal from the Pope to start an uprising among Catholics, in particular the Irish Catholics who had been flooding into the country. And he wrote that the effects of this block, if placed in the monument, will be a mortification to nearly every American Protestant who looks upon it, and its influence upon the zealous supporters of the Roman hierarchy will be tremendous, even especially with foreigners. So the ironic thing is that uh, the man whose monument this was to uh, probably would not have supported them in their actions. So we probably think that George Washington has a soft spot in his, for St. Patrick's Day because of the evacuation of Boston to begin with. Um, but also during the brutal winter of 1780, not in Valley Forge, but in Morristown, New Jersey, George Washington gave his troops a rare day off for the first time in a year, and it happened to be for St. Patrick's Day because about a quarter of his troops uh, were Irish-born. And Washington, when he's in charge of the Continental Army, actually banned the annual practice of burning effigies of the Pope on Guy Fawkes Day, a practice that would take place in Boston as well. And in his orders, he wrote that to be insulting their religion is so monstrous as not to be suffered or excused. So such is the animosity towards Catholics and Irish Catholics in 1854 that a gift from the Pope gets tossed into the Potomac River. So how do we get to this point? 
So let's go back to Ireland. Ireland uh, had been under British rule for 700 years. And after, at this, ironically, at, after the signal of the only English-born pope gave a signal to King Henry that he would be free to, uh, to colonize Ireland back in the late 1100s. So Britain is ruling Ireland, and things get especially vicious when Oliver Cromwell uh, comes to power in England and exterminates tens of thousands of Irish Catholics, pushes a lot of, uh, a lot of the Catholics back to the rugged western and southern areas of Ireland. And then in 1690, there is the infamous Battle of the Boyne, where the forces of William of Orange, the Protestant forces, uh, defeat King James II, the Catholic forces. That leads to the real Protestant ascendancy in Ireland itself. And it's after that that starts the transplantation of Scottish Presbyterians and English Anglicans to the northern counties of Ireland that is the root of the... Um, the, the distinction between Ireland and Northern Ireland, that's, of course, back in the news again today with, with Brexit. So after Cromwell, after the Battle of the Boyne, things even get worse for the Irish Catholics with the passage of the penal laws that start to come into effect in 1695, and some of them would remain on the books until, uh, until as late as 1829. But under the penal laws, if you were an Irish Catholic, you were not allowed to vote, you were not allowed to hold public office, you couldn't freely worship, you couldn't send your kids to a Catholic, a Catholic teacher, you couldn't have a Catholic teacher come in to teach your kids either. Uh, you could not own firearms or a horse that was worth more than five pounds. You could have a knife, but it needed to be chained to a table so that you couldn't use it against the local constables. And it also was, in terms of land distribution, these penal laws really changed the way that land is structured in Ireland. So if you were an Irish Catholic, you could not pass your land down to your next Irish Catholic, your Irish Catholic next to kin. You needed to divide it amongst all your sons. However, if one of your sons decided to convert to becoming a Protestant, then you could pass the entire piece of land down to that one son. So what happens is that these plots of land start to, each generation becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, which makes them more difficult to farm. And Protestant landlords back in Britain started becoming in charge of the land, so that by the time of the 18, uh, around 1800, four-fifths of Ireland is owned by absentee landlords back in Britain. So what happens is in the, in the early 1800s, you have land that's getting smaller and smaller. Uh, you also then have a tremendous growth in the population that happens at the same time. So between 1800 and 1845, the population of Ireland, Ireland grows from almost four, a little over four million to nearly eight million. So you, you have people living in crowded uh, ho hovels on, on small plots of land. The population is exploding and your, their, their rights are being taken away. So much so that when Frederick Douglass visits Ireland in 1845, he writes that, I see much here to ri remind me of my former condition. And of course, we know what his former condition was. So this is the state of Ireland at the time that the potato blight happens in 1845. And the microorganism that causes a potato blight actually originates in the Americas, travels from the United States to Europe, uh, strikes uh, Belgium, the lowlands area of, uh, of Europe, travels across the English Channel to England and then over to Ireland. But only in Ireland does it become so deadly, and that's because of the subsistence that the Irish had to have for, uh, on the potato, and that's because the potato could grow on the, uh, in these small, rocky plots in the damp climate, and it was really the only crop that you could grow on the small plot of land that you could then subsist upon because they were very rich in nutrition, uh, and you could grow them in such plentiful numbers. So the Irish ate potatoes for breakfast, they ate them for lunch, they ate them for dinner. The average Irish man ate more than 14 pounds a day, or excuse me, 
uh, 14 pounds a day per person what was what was needed to subsist. So that's that's how much potatoes were being uh, were being grown in Ireland at the time. And when Irish refer to this time period, they don't call it the potato famine. They, they refer to it as a great hunger because the famine implies that there's a lack of food in the country. At the same time that the potato crop is failing, though, Britain is allowing the export of wheat and oats and barley under armed guards back to cities in England and out of the country. So uh, th this, is, this is why a lot of the Irish re will refer to it as a great hunger and not as the potato famine. And the British government uh, that comes into power in 1846 is very reluctant to interfere with the free market forces of capitalism and uh, do not do very effective work in terms of any uh, relief programs for the Irish. And for some British, they actually see this as a divine solution to a problem of overpopulation in Ireland. And Charles Trevelyan, who was the British civil servant who was in charge of the relief efforts, actually wrote that the judgment of God sent a calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. That calamity must not be too much mitigated. So after the potato famine strikes, you have uh, a million Irish who die. You have two million who flee the country. About a million, a little more than a million of them will, will go to North America. And there's a exodus on a flotilla of about 5,000 boats end up taking the Irish across the Atlantic to North America. And these ships were, uh, some of them were just barely converted freight ships. They were, some of them were used in the African slave trade. These were not regular passenger ships. And the Irish who are coming aboard, of course, are starving. They are suffering from disease. And they are crowded into these ships and the diseases just run rampant uh, below deck. They lack clean water, clean air. If the average adult was allotted about, it was an average of about 18 inches of bed space. So it's not surprising that it's a very deadly passage for a lot of the Irish, and these ships then become nicknamed coffin ships. And in 1847, which is really the worst year of the Great Hunger that's referred to as Black 47, it's estimated that about a quarter of the passengers uh, die en route to Canada and the United States. Uh, they die on board the ships. Then uh, once a passenger died, they would just wrap them in uh, white cloth. They'd weigh them down with stones and send them overboard. And there's some eyewitness reports that sharks would follow behind the coffin ships just waiting uh, for something to eat because there'd just be so many corpses that would be thrown overboard from, from these ships. So they arrive here in the United States and tensions, there's already tensions between Irish Catholics and Americans and perhaps nowhere worse than right here in Boston, which is a city that was founded by the Puritans who were seeking to, to escape the papism of the Catholic Church and then all of a sudden uh, they're here in America and then Catholics start, start to show up. Uh, but the Puritan mindset still exists. So in 1700, uh, a law is passed that would ban priests from coming into Massachusetts. And if a priest was found in Massachusetts, he could be, he could be sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, Guy Fawkes Day in Boston uh, would be capped with the burning of the effigy of, of the Pope in, in the streets. And then uh, you have events such as in 1834, the burning of the Ursuline uh, convent in Charlestown, when there were rumors of uh, sexual abuse taking place inside the convent. There are stories that a priest had raped a, a nun, forced her to have the baby, and then strangled the baby with his bare hands. This leads to a Protestant, uh, a Protestant riot. Uh, there's the Broad Street riot in 1837 that takes place between a band of Yankee firefighters and a uh, bunch of Irish uh, attending a funeral procession. It's probably something that could be ripped right out of the gangs of, of New York, of, of that movie. 
In 1844, in Philadelphia, there were the Bible riots between Protestants and Catholics because there were false reports that Catholics wanted to ban Bibles in public schools. So you have the Catholic Church is already becoming uneasy with, um, with nativism and anti-Catholicism even before the, the Great Hunger Strikes. So in New York City, the archbishop there uh, orders a wall to be built around the old St. Patrick's Cathedral. In Boston, there were uh, parishioners who would man the they, they would man uh, the churches with guns by night to make sure that no one would come to burn their churches down. And things are just going to get much much worse once the Great Hunger Strikes and you start having these tens of thousands of Irish Catholics starting to flood into the country. And in Boston, at the time the Great Hunger starts, it's a city of about 100,000 people. And in short order, you have 37,000 Irish who are just pouring into the city. And these are newcomers unlike any that the United States has seen before. They're different because they are they're refugees. They're, they're fleeing a humanitarian crisis. They are not coming to America to pursue the American dream. They're just coming here because uh, they, they need something to eat. In a lot of cases, the Irish... Uh, spent their last money just to gain passage on the coffin ships. In other cases, their passage was paid for by their absentee landlords because it was cheaper to send them to the United States than it was to pay for their relief efforts in Ireland itself, which they were being mandated by the British government to, to do so. So uh, the, the biggest change, though, is that these are Catholics. Um, they arrive speaking a quarter of them a foreign language, Irish. They, uh, most of them are illiterate. So they are very different from American society at, the, at that time. And the Irish are unmoored when they come to America because they are a predominantly rural people. They come to the United States, they arrive with no money, and most of them end up settling in America within walking distance of where they got off on their ships. So whereas other groups, immigrant groups during the time period, such as, such as the Germans, may have landed on the eastern seaboard and then progressed inland, the Irish are settling right in the heart of the cities of Boston and New York City and Baltimore. And it's a completely alien lifestyle to what they're used to. They know how to farm. When they come to America, basically they have to make that transition to where now they're huddled in tenements and they have to work manual labor jobs and they're coming in at the bottom of the economic ladder. So a lot of the Irish are going to be working in those manual labor jobs, digging sewers or uh, masonry work, anything to be done uh, with their hands at the bottom of the economic ladder. And they did not assimilate into American culture. The way that they had survived for 700 years of English rule and not becoming the English was by preserving their language and their customs and their religion. And so they did not assimilate into uh, English culture despite the best efforts of England's rulers to try to anglicize the Irish. So that when they come to the United States, why should they do anything different than what they have been doing for the last 700 years? So they're very much like a snake that coils itself for protection. They, they become very tribal. They held together in parishes and fraternal organizations. And historian Oscar Hanlon said that the Irish who live, arrived in Boston were, quote, had a, had a, quote, fate to remain a massive lump in the community, undigested, undigestible which I think is a pretty apt description of, of, uh, of the state of affairs in the 1840s and 1850s. And of course, there's animosity towards the Irish from those who were doing those manual labor jobs. So here comes a group of foreigners who are coming to take your job. They're bringing crime, they're bringing disease, they're overwhelming the budgets of social institutions. Stop me if you've heard this anywhere recently. <laughs> so in, in, and in, you have a case in 1848 where some of the Irish enlist in the army to go fight in the Mexican-American War. And there's a group of them who end up defecting from 
the American side to go fight on the Mexican side because of the ill treatment that they've received from bigoted commanders. Plus, there's the prospect of earning a little bit more money on the Mexican side. Then there's also that they will share a common religion with the Mexicans and not the Americans in this war. And they formed what was called the St. Patrick's Battalion, or what was known uh, in Mexico as the San Patricios. And it turns out that 50 members of the San Patricios would be executed for treason by the United States Army. So now you have foreigners who've coming into the country and are fighting with the enemy against uh, Americans. So that, that just adds to, um, adds to this whole cocktail of, of, uh, of discrimination and, and um, bigotry. And then you have the rumors that the Pope and his army are going to land in the United States, uh, overthrow the government, and install a new Vatican in, wait for it, Cincinnati, <laughs> where they will impose Catholic, uh, the, the, impose the Catholic canon as the law of the land to supersede the Constitution. So it's true that you will see no Irish need apply um, notices in newspapers. There are these signs that you see oftentimes like on eBay or that are like no Irish need apply, but I think they're all like copyright 1974 or something like that. I don't think these are the authentic, I'm not sure it was ever as blatant as sticking it in, in the window front, but it was definitely in the newspapers. All you need to do is take your library card, search through the back issues of uh, newspapers, and you're going to find it without a problem. And depictions of the Irish at the time. So you have these, the stage Irishman who's depicted as the drunken buffoon. You have the drawings of, of Thomas Nast, uh, which are pretty typical, showing the Irish as these simian-like figures with a proclivity for violence and billy clubs and, and always some sort of jug of alcohol around them. Bottle of rum, in this case, on top of the gunpowder, uh, symbolizing their, their violent nature. Um, here's another one where they're in cahoots with the, the Catholic Church, and this is a famous NAS one here with the, the bishops with their mitres, uh, like crocodiles, coming ashore to, to prey on the Americans with St. Peter's Church in the, in the background there. So all this combines then in the 1850s to give rise to the anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant American party who has the slogan, America for Americans. And uh, they become commonly known as the know-nothings because if they were asked about their doings, they would give the Colonel Schultz answer, you know, I know nothing about what, what's going on here or who are members. But the plan of the, the, the program that the know-nothings were interested in implementing were limiting elected office to native-born Americans, unless you were a Native American or a Catholic. Uh, there was a, they wanted to implement a 21-year waiting period before anyone could become an American citizen. And then 1854 is a particularly bad year to be poor and Irish and Catholic, and especially if you were all three. That's the year that the Pope's blo uh, marble block gets dumped into the Potomac River. Then in Ellsworth, Maine, Know Nothings dragged a Jesuit priest by the name of John Baptist uh, out of uh, his rectory because he had been denouncing the use of the King James Bible, the Protestant Bible, in public schools. And they gave him an old colonial tar and feathering. Uh, later that year, in Bath, Maine, uh, a, a group of Protestants uh, smashed pews in a church that had just been purchased by I Irish Catholics. Uh, they set the whole church on fire. Uh, a year later, the Catholic bishop from, from Portland came back to Bath to lay the cornerstone for the replacement church, and he was chased away and beaten by another mob. So the Know Nothing Revolt, though, really uh, gains political power with the elections in 1854. So there are more than 100 congressmen, eight governors uh, that, are, that are Know Nothings that are elected, and they find their best results here in Massachusetts, where they sweep all statewide elected offices. 
and all but three of the seats in the Massachusetts legislature are won by know-nothings. And they start to enact the requirement that the King James Bible would be read in public schools. They break up Irish-American militias. Uh, they start to do uh, raids on rectories and convents. And they, along with New York, start to deport uh, thousands and thousands of Irish back to the, to the British Isles. And the violence just keeps on coming the following year. In, in Louisville, Kentucky, in what's known as Bloody Monday, a group of know-nothings who were guarding a polling station started street fights with German and Irish Catholics that had anywhere from 20 to 100 people killed, depending on, on the estimates. Uh, in 1856, the American Party, the Know Nothings, actually have a presidential candidate, Millard Fillmore. So I think if Alec Baldwin ever retires the Donald Trump uh, <laughs> impersonation. So the former president uh, runs under this third party ticket, and he is running against uh, one of the candidates, John C. Fremont, who is accused of being both a cannibal and a Catholic. And John C. Fremont doesn't know which one is worse to be accused of at the time. So Miller Fillmore runs, and he actually gains uh, more than 20% of the vote and eight electoral votes uh, in that election of 1856. But the party starts to splinter along with the rest of the country uh, with the Civil War, basically just differences over internally about how to approach the issue of slavery supersedes any issues of, of immigration at, at the time. So slowly things start to change a little bit. Here in Boston, 1859, priests are finally allowed to visit Catholic patients in the city hospital. But at the same time, hundreds of Catholic students are expelled for, uh, from the city schools because they were protesting the beating of a student who had protested the use of the Protestant version of the Lord's Prayer in the schools. So the Civil War comes, 1861. This is where things are, are start to slowly are going to turn here. So some of the Irish are going to gain acceptance by fighting in the Civil War and for the sacrifice that they make in defense of the Union. But there's still these very violent spasms that are happening as the Irish are trying to assimilate into the United States. So, of course, famously, there's the draft riots in New York in 1863 because the Irish are the ones who, again, are being put on the front lines in a lot of these battles. So by some estimates, there's 200,000 Irishmen fighting in the war. and They took heavy losses at Bull Run and Antietam and Fredericksburg. And by 1863, uh, a lot of them are just, uh, they're, they're tired of being used as cannon, uh, cannon fodder and fighting a war that is now about the liberation of African Americans who are going to end up competing against them for the manual labor jobs that they work in. Uh, what's a little less known, though, is something that happened in New York City in 1870 and 1871, and these were the Orange Riots. So. Going back to the 1690 Battle of the Boyne, and if any of you see present day events in, in Northern Ireland, this happened a little bit more before the peace process 20 years ago. But to commemorate the victory, the Protestant victory in the Battle of the Boyne, every July, I think it's July 12th, uh, the Protestants would dress up and parade through, uh, the, the, through Irish uh, cities in, in, in the north of Ireland. So they bring the same tradition to America with them. So in 1870, uh, to commemorate the Battle of the Boyne, a group of Protestants takes to the streets of New York, and there turns out to be a riot between them and the Catholics, and, and I think the death toll is about six. The following year, however, despite everything that happened the year before, the city grants the Protestants the ability to march again. This time they've got the police and the National Guard, called out, but as soon as the Protestants start marching, the Catholics start throwing bottles and rocks and projectiles, and the police open fire uh, on, on the crowds, and 60 people are killed. So now you have the Irish importing their religious ethnic tensions from Ireland into America, 
and 60 people die on the street in New York. Just think if that had happened to, uh, for another immigrant group in, in these days. So you have these spasms of violence, and then as I write about in the When the Irish Invaded Canada, you have uh, this group called the Fenian Brotherhood who stages these attacks on Canada in the aftermath of the Civil War. And they call themselves the Irish Republican Army. There's not a direct through line from them to the, the current Irish Republican Army, but they, they did use the same name. And their goal is to attack the British province of Canada and essentially hold it hostage and trade it for Ireland's independence. And they fight battles in 1866, and the Irish have uh, a couple of victories actually over the, 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 the troops there. And a man by the name of John O'Neill leads them to victory in this battle of Ridgeway, and he emerges from this battle as the real, uh, as an Irish American hero. He's known as the hero of Ridgeway, and he never gets, gives up his dream of attacking Canada, and he rises to become the president of the Fenian Brotherhood. And in 1870, he manages to stockpile a whole bunch of weapons, secretly transports them to the border. Uh, the Canadian border in Vermont and upstate New York, and he is uh, he launches an attack on uh, on Canada again, and this man John Boyle O'Reilly is there to witness everything, and John Boyle O'Reilly was bred to hate the British. Uh, he was born along the River Boyne. Uh, he could wander, he could look out from the castle, the 12th century castle he lived in and see the battlefield that the Battle of the Boyne was fought on. He wandered through Druid, Druid ruins and megalithic sites. And uh, he heard tales of the O'Reilly clan, those ancestors of his who dared to rise up and fight against the British. So when, uh, when he's a teenager, he joins the British army not to uh, join the cause of the British, but to be a secret infiltrator to, uh, for an organization called the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is the forerunner of the, the IRA. And he's there to try to, uh, uh, to, to sort of lead an, an uprising inside the, the British Army, but they find him out. Uh, he's court-martialed and then sentenced to 20 years imprisonment. Um, if any of you go or partial to a red wine called 19 Crimes. Uh, this is actually the photo of John Boyle O'Reilly who's on this Australian wine and you'll see the connection in, in a second. So he's initially set to some of the worst British prisons such as Dartmoor and Chatham. Uh, he's put in Millbank Prison which is right along the banks of the Thames and forced into solitary confinement for eight months. Uh, he could hear the chimes of Big Ben every 15 minutes but that's about the only communication that he had. And finally, he was shipped over to Australia on the last uh, convict ship with a group of about 60 Fenians. And in 1869, he manages to stage a dramatic escape. He is, uh, he is in this penal colony in Western Australia. He manages to escape, spend 17 days in the Australian bush. He would eat by take, ca catching possums and smashing them against trees to kill them and then, and then eat them. And then he finally was able to get aboard a waiting ship uh, after 17 days out in the bush and escape to America. Comes to Boston in early 1870, and he has always been sort of a budding journalist and, and, and a writer, and he gets a job with the Pilot newspaper, which is still in print today. It's the newspaper from the Archdiocese of Boston. Back in 1870, it's the foremost newspaper for, for Irish Catholics. And one of his first assignments is to be a war correspondent to go cover John O'Neill's 1870 invasion of, of Vermont. So John Boyle O'Reilly is still a fugitive from the British government, so he just needs to be careful when he's covering this war not to set foot uh, on Canadian soil, on the British Empire, or he could be arrested again and serve out the rest of his, his 20 year sentence. So, he goes to cover this attack in 1870, and the attack makes it all of about 30 yards into Canada before a Canadian defense force that's one-tenth the size of the Irish Army, but it's stationed up on this hillside above the road that John O'Neill chose to go into uh, Canada. So 
30 yards into Canada, a shot comes out from this hillside, shoots the lead Fenian dead on the ground. The others start scattering for cover, and that's as deep as they will get into Canadian territory. John O'Neill is trying to rally his men, calls them cowards for hiding, but then all of a sudden, a U.S. Marshal takes him into custody on the battlefield and whisks him away to jail, which is a pretty ignominious uh, conclusion to, uh, ba to your battlefield leadership. And of course, there were these uh, illustrations then showing John O'Neill as with the bottle of liquor at his feet, with the simian look, and, uh, and, and that's how the Irish were depicted. And then there was another attack a day later from upstate New York that got about uh, 300 yards into Canada before it was, it was finally brushed back. The Irish had to make a run for the border, drop their weapons, and in a full sprint, uh, full sprint back to America. And newspapers started to joke that, that IRA, the new motto, uh, the, new, the initials IRA stood for their new motto, which was, I ran away. So John Boyle O'Reilly uh, really changes. Uh, the, 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 this whole fiasco does something that not eight months of solitary confinement, not transportation to the far side of the world could do, and it starts to temper his uh, patriotism, his enthusiasm for using military uh, force to, to get change for the Irish, and he starts to become an advocate for the Irish to better assimilate into American culture. And he, started, he would like to quip that we can do Ireland more good by our Americanism than by our Irishmen. And he became sort of a human hyphen between the Irish community and the Brahmin community here in Boston. Uh, he, when Oscar Wilde came to America, he, he's the person who introduced him to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. It's this real uh, blending of the two cultures. And of course, he's far from being Mayflower stock, but he's given the job of, of uh, speaking at the dedication of the National Monument to the Forefathers in Plymouth. His poetry is read at the dedication of the Boston Massacre Monument on Boston Common. And when O'Reilly passes away suddenly at the age of 46 in 1890, uh, the pilot calls him the greatest of Irish Americans, and many people believe that. And there's a big, uh, uh, not a funeral service, but a memorial service at, at Tremont Temple, and one of the speakers who gets on stage where O'Reilly's portrait is up there flanked by both the Irish flag and the American flag. And in his eulogy, he says of O'Reilly that he assimilated himself so perfectly among us that we hardly turn to remember that he came to us in exile. So really thanks in part to O'Reilly, the Irish started to weave themselves into the tapestry of Boston by the time of his death. Uh, and, and there's a memorial to John Boyle O'Reilly at the Fenway at the end of, um, I think at the end of uh, Boylston Street. And uh, so, so O'Reilly is this, is this figure that, that really, I think it's symbolic of this, of this change of the Irish. And the other thing that happens is that the Irish are becoming, they're using force, the, the force of their numbers because they are voting, they vote in higher proportion than other groups. And they start to gain political power just by their sheer numbers. So even after the Fenians attacked Canada in 1866 in violation of American laws, both the Democrats and the Republicans are, um, are, are trying to gain the support of the Irish by uh, bringing the Fenians onto the floor of Congress and having them shake hands with all their politicians because they know the power of the Irish vote. And by 1880, there's an Irish mayor in New York City. 1884, there's an Irish mayor here in, in, in Boston. So really, by the end of the 1800s, the Irish are finally settling into assimilating into American culture. But it, it, it took a generation or two to happen. And I think one of the, the sad codas to the story, though, is that when the Irish come to power, they don't necessarily learn the lessons from what happened to them, and they start denigrating the new waves of immigrants who start coming into the country, the Italians, the Chinese. Um, there is a, a, a labor leader named Dennis Kearney who would go around saying, that whatever happens, the Chinese must go, because they were there to take the jobs away from the Irish. So I think there is this dangerous thought in Irish America that uh, well, yeah, when the Irish came to America, they faced discrimination, but 
you know, they came here because they wanted to fit right into American society and they worked hard and they, they, they blended in and did everything that America asked of them. And the, the history is just a little more nuanced than that. The assimilation is a lot more rocky. And I think the assimilation of any group is probably going to go through, through those. So I think it's just, it's good to know this history, I think, to just build some empathy into the experiences that the Irish had in the 1840s, 1850s. And uh, and for for immigrants who are coming into this country today as well. So, uh, with that, does anyone have any any questions? Yes. No, I mean, there is a very strong, deep connection between Irish Americans and Ireland today. And it's, it, and it's not necessarily something that they're going back and visiting that often, but I think there is, there is pride in that Irish identity. I think part of it has to deal with the experiences, sort of the tribulations that the Irish had gone through to become eventually part of mainstream society. But I think there, you know, I, I, there's, you know, everyone wants to be Irish for the day, you know, on St. Patrick's Day, and the Irish themselves, I think, do have that deep affinity to Ireland. Now, whether that's really more just a shallowness and it isn't necessarily as deep, um, you know, there's a difference between, just as a side note to this too, you know, the St. Patrick's Day traditions that we all know and that you're all gonna see tomorrow, parades, corned beef and cabbage, you know, green beer, shamrock shakes, all that. That's all born in America. That's all a reaction to the know-nothings. In Ireland, St. Patrick's Day is a holy day. It's not a holiday uh, until, until recent decades. So I think a lot of the pride that Irish people have in being Irish is maybe just, it's actually masking more pride of being Irish American than having the, the, those Irish roots too. Yeah. Yes? Thank you. <laughs> you know. I was going to say, you, you had mentioned in the, in the one, I think that the Irish, no matter how many generations were separated, we still identify as Irish first and not American. I, I think that's kind of, I'd like we're to Irish add, American, not American. I would like to add one thing uh, as a native Irish person. Um, I traveled a lot in my business, and now I'm a tour guide near Boston. I meet a lot of visitors. And... Um, I'm blown away by the number of people I meet who have no ethnic connection to Ireland but have been to Ireland and uh, are extremely gracious and complimentary about the reception they have had there. And my response is always the same. Americans are loved in Ireland and they get the red carpet treatment when they go there historically because of what America has represented to Ireland over the generations. So it's a very big time payback when an American goes to Ireland. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of that whole package. Yep. Yeah. Plus we can get there about the same time as it takes to get to California, so it's really mm -hmm. great for us here in Boston. Just, just to add to that, this is a, a saying um, in these parts that there are only two types of people in this world, those who are Irish and those who want to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's fairly safe to go out, you know, because of all the stereotype, uh, yeah. stereotypical uh, behavior, and of course it becomes a liquor holiday. And yeah. Eventually, me and a lot of other Irish people would love that to stop, but it probably yeah. isn't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, sir. I'd just like to make a comment that um, next month there'll be a 16 foot Celtic cross hoisted to your island. Raising that, because uh, that is uh, part of the Irish story in Boston too. Because there was a 
quarantine station out on Deer Island. So for the Irish who were coming over in the coffin ships, if there were any Tavisos on board, we might be taken and put into the quarantine station. And I think maybe, maybe about 800 Irish ended up dying and on Deer Island, never actually getting to the American mainland. So there's a, there's a deep connection between the Irish story and American and Deer Island. So it's great that the, the mine manual has been a long time coming, but it's great that it's going to be out there. Yes. So um, your story is going to end in 1979. Um, what type of discrimination remains there, or was there any? I mean, my grandmother came to Boston in 1928. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it really lessens. I think I would say, you know, someone asked me the other day, like, where does the real root of the discrimination come from? And I think the real root of it is the Catholic nature of the, the Irish who are coming in. Not that they spoke a different language or um, you know the conditions that they arrived in necessarily, because many Germans were coming in under similar conditions as well. And so I think it's really that Catholic aspect to it. So once you then not only the Irish are in such numbers, by the time it gets to like the 1880s, you do have the arrivals of Italians and other Catholics from Eastern Europe that are you know the, the, the population of Catholics is now becoming so great that it's not outside the mainstream anymore. And I mean, the final death you know, with Coffin is always pointed to is 1960 and John F. Kennedy's election, where you know, probably an Irish Catholic was able to be in the White House. Um, but you know, I, I think. So remember the worry that the hmm. Pope might be controlling in the right. yeah. But I think these days, when you have Irish Catholic candidates, you don't have that same issue. So I mean, it does it does endure that time period. So I think we're out. Uh